Michael, um, it really is an honor to be here talking about my mother. I'm a little nervous because it's she's <laughs> she's not an easy woman to define or to um, yeah to explain in any way. I mean, I think that even as a you know as a mother, she was a lovely mother, but she was also an elusive and fascinating person. Um, she was private, deeply emotional, modest, elegant very giving. Um, she was wounded. She was intrepid. She was a fiercely dedicated mother, but she was also a tremendous artist who refused to be controlled. Um, and, uh, you know, as I saw it, growing up, Inga really hailed from a terrible mythic past, which is that she grew up um, in her adolescence and uh, very early adulthood in Nazi Germany. Um, and you know, bore the marks of having seen the belly of the beast like all her life. Um, she was an Austrian young girl uh, who refused to join the Nazi um, Hitler youth. Her father was a member of the Nazi party, although um, he was more of a patriot, it seems, than anything else than a sentimentalist about his country. Um, and uh, her mother took her to see the great exhibits that the Nazis so thoughtfully uh, put on of um, forbidden art, which included a lot of modern art. And that had a great influence on my mother um, for later. This is a, 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 just an image of her own life as she planned it out. She, sh she made a visual map of her life and uh, it's in German, but you see on the left, it says Österreich, meaning her beginnings in Austria her childhood in Germany and France, going to school and then, um, and so on. And one, one, one uh, little anecdote that I love about my mother that I think says a lot about her character was that when her parents who were scientists um, moved to France from Germany um, to do some work there, my mother was placed in a, in a class um, at the end, she was at the back of the class. She was about eight years old. She was put in the back with the worst students. And she was so insulted to be in the back of the class. And she was steaming. And she sat there, there back there. And she thought, by the end of the year, I'm going to be in the front of the class. And she spoke no French. But by the end of the year, she spoke French. And she was at the front of the class. And this, to me, shows both her determination, her hard work, her work ethic. But also, she was a genius. Um, at languages. Uh, she spoke eight languages. Um, by the end of her life, she spoke German, French, Romanian, English, Spanish, Italian, Russian, and Chinese. And she learned these languages largely so that she could um, penetrate the cultures that she wanted to photograph. Th this is in the pop-up show. These are some of the few, few of the many things in the pop-up show. This is a this is a passport for um, Austria, uh, and this was one her British passport. She was briefly married to a man that she always um, referred to as Mr. Birch, <laughs> without too much affection, I must say. Um, one of the great. Oh, I'll tell that story a bit later. Um, this is her American passport. Uh, and this is her Magnum Photos card. Um, she was the first female member of Magnum Photos, I think right to be followed by Eve Arnold, whose, uh, whose archive is also at the Beinecke. Um, so um, my mother had many fights with her father about, um, about Nazism um, and she was very uncomfortable and very unhappy to be in that, within that regime. Uh, um, there, uh, one great story that there is about my mother is that she, you know, she stayed in Berlin in the, toward the end of the war, her parents moved to Salzburg and she stayed on to finish her studies as a linguist. And she was, um, working in a munitions factory. Uh, and there was a, a bomb hit it and there was a big hole in the wall and she basically walked out the hole in the wall and it was the end of the war and the whole city was in flames. 
And she knew that she had to get somehow to her parents in Salzburg and she didn't have any money and there was there were no trains practically. So she managed to, she had a little salt that she thought she could sell. She was 22 years old and she, it's almost 450 miles from um, Berlin to Salzburg. And she basically walked the whole way. And a lot of the time she walked, she was walking with refugees from the East, um, some of whom were carrying their own dead children and babies uh, that um, hadn't survived the trip. And she had a, a great, um, she, she felt a lot for refugees all her life because of that. And she made it to Salzburg. And um, when she got there, uh, she was so she was so disoriented that she couldn't remember how to get to her parents' house. She couldn't remember the address. She'd only been there a couple of times to visit. And she was so distraught, she was ready to jump off a bridge when she heard a, 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 a young man's voice and she turned and there was a man who was a German soldier with one leg on crutches. And he said, what's the matter? And she was hysterical. She explained that she couldn't find her parents, that she, you know, she just didn't want to be around anymore. And he said, look, let's find your parents. And he took her all over the city of Salzburg in areas that he thought she might be living. Um, and she, finally they ended up in this rather nice street. And he said, I don't think you live here. And then she recognized her home, her, her parents' home. She went running up the uh, little path and she, she knocked on the door and her mother um, opened the door and it was a gr wonderful greeting and she turned around to thank the man and he was gone and she looked up the street and she looked down the street and he was gone and she never knew for the rest of her life if she if he had actually existed but he was her angel and he uh he saved her so um you know she worked in vienna after the war for a little while and it was only when uh with with ernst haas who was a wonderful photographer and she was a writer for him and and, and he was a he, they worked for Hoyte magazine and uh, in her brief marriage, she was in Venice with Mr. Birch and uh, it was very beautiful light one day. She was a writer, not a photographer. And she called Cornel Kappa, who was the head of Magnum Photos, whom she had known uh, through Ernst Haas. And she said, listen, the light here is so beautiful. You have to send a photographer right now. It just rained. It's absolutely gorgeous. And he said, Cornell said, you know, you idiot, if I send a photographer, the light will have changed. You take the pictures. And she said, you idiot. So once again, she was in the back of the class. She thought, I'm going to get to the front of the class. So she went and she got, she borrowed her, hus borrowed her husband's camera and she got some film, which, which she asked the clerk to help her put into the camera. She took the photos, some, some photos of this beautiful light. And they were, in fact, very special photographs. And it was really like a lightning moment. And she realized this is my vocation. Um, but it took a long time for her to really figure out the technical you know, know-how and how to do it. And she ended up working with Henri Cartier-Bresson as his assistant for a time. And um, you know, Henri Cartier-Bresson, who is so famous for the, um, the uh, decisive moment where, uh, you know, the, the, the moment where all the geometry converges in, inside of an image and you have to kind of click the camera at that very moment. And you have to remember that at that time, you know, they were working with cameras that had viewfinders. And so the top and the bottom of the focus of the diopter had to match. They had to find that focus and still get these, these images just at the moment that things are happening. And it was like, you know, you almost had to anticipate what was happening. And I think, I always think about Keats's negative capability and how, how deeply you have to really concentrate and almost lose yourself in an image in order to, um, I don't know, to, to capture the moment that's about to happen in such a way. Um, in Paris, you know, where my mother's lived for a decade, um, there was a real party atmosphere. You know, she, I think there was a sense of like, just they were so happy to be alive. It was such a sense of euphoria, almost like, you know, hysteria. Uh, all these wonderful photographers having converged from all over the world, um, well, especially Europe, you know, and having survived. And they all knew people who had died. And I think that it was a, it was a really heady, heady moment. Um, she ended up photographing in Spain, France, Iran, Afghanistan, all over the world. Um, and for, it was the really the great period of um, magazine uh, 
commissions for photographers where, you know, like for example, Life Magazine was one of the great sources of, of work for them. And they would be sent to do these photographic essays. And um, so much of her work was done for these, these types of things. She spent a lot of time in Spain. Um, I would say that that was one of the main, the, the, the countries that she learned the, the lear learned the deepest and photographed most profoundly. Um, there was a moment where she wasn't allowed, I don't have a photograph from the interior, but she wasn't, there was normally no women allowed to photograph the matador, but she was allowed in to photograph the matador. It's a wonderful, some wonderful photographs. Here they are going inside the, uh, the ring. This is my mother in Iran wearing being modestly clad um, with her photographs. She traveled around Iran with a, with a translator, a guide, and she um, was very brave and very uh, fearless. I love this photograph so much. This was in the 1950s. She was also photograph uh, commissioned to photograph their industry, industrial um, complex. Um, she photographed artists a great deal um, and had a very particular love of artists and understanding of them. I think that in some ways her experience of the tremendous ugliness of, um, of what human beings can do to each other which I think marked her for the rest of her life, also made her really appreciate what art can do, which is sort of to make sense of life, to find coherence in an image that seems chaotic. And I think she found a kind of refuge in geometry. She taught me a lot about the inherent geometry of the triangle, which you can see many triangles in this photograph, and how they, how they anchor an image and how emotion can be translated through an image. I think my mother really turned me into a visual artist without me understanding that at all at the time, but she talked to me a lot about um, the power of, of the image. I love this picture so much to me. I just absolutely love it. This is in London. Um, She also had a kind of humor, which I think was very understated and never really went towards satire, but was a kind of merciful humor. Like if you look at this image, which is so wonderful with the patterns and everything in the composition, but then you look at the twin dogs that both look completely insane. It's this sort of, and this man, <laughs> I just love. So in 1961, I think she, the, I believe that was the year, I'm not 100% sure. She and Henri Cartier-Bresson were among the many um, artists, rather photographers from Magnum who were commissioned to go and photograph the Misfits, which was a movie that was gonna be, that was written by Arthur Miller, that was going to be directed by John Huston and starred Marilyn Monroe, um, Clark Gable Ma and, Ma uh, and um, Montgomery Clift. Um, all of whom, in horrible coincidence, all the actors were going to die within a couple of years of that film. But anyway, she traveled across the country with Ari Cartier-Bresson, and some of her images of that time are so wonderfully um, like made by somebody who almost like a Martian landed and was looking at the United States. I think she felt so, so alienated from the culture, but also fascinated by it. And it also happened that she was a vegetarian and didn't ever really eat meat much at all that I ever saw in my life. But um, so she, and she also didn't eat fat. So basically she ate apples all the way across the country um, until she got to Nevada. I guess she kept eating apples after the misfits. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, this is New York, 1950s. Elizabeth Arden. Window washers.
I think my mother was particularly attuned to the phenomenon of performance. Um, you can see it in this in this picture particularly, but also you see it also even in some of the portraits which she did of artists and you see how she, you see how people wish to present themselves and then what she sees behind that. And then also her fascination with actual film sets and then theater sets, which she, she ended up photographing quite a lot of theater sets um, when she married a playwright. This is New York, I think in the nineties. Or I, well, maybe that's China, I'm actually not sure. This is um, Russia. She, as I said, she learned Russian um, over a period of years and ended up going on extensive trips with my father in part. And they ended up collaborating on a book called In Russia, my father, Arthur Miller, who she um, was later to marry. No, sorry. This is China, 1980s. She had also learned Chinese for this and was able to read poetry and speak conversationally, um, amazingly. Uh, and I think it really, it really changed the way that she was able to photograph the country. She also went back in the 1980s um, again to photograph uh, my father. Did, they did a, a production of Death of a Salesman in Chinese. This was particularly important in the 80s because all of the actors, the older actors that like Ying Roshang, who's the man in the middle in the pink pinstripe suit, had been um, victims of the Cultural Revolution and had all been doing menial jobs for maybe 20 years and, you know, in the middle of nowhere and had finally been able to come back to their craft. And so they were particularly, it was a very moving time. And it was striking how, how relevant the play seemed despite the difference in culture. And this is an example, I think, of her, the, the sort of absurdism of some of her photographs. This was a llama that she happened to see sticking its head out of a taxi cab in New York City. And she ended up doing a story about this llama and its owner. These are some of her captions she wrote very elaborate captions. Um, I believe some of these are part of the uh, exhibit as well. She, her, she was a wonderful writer, very humorous. This is the, the llama's owner. And she followed them home. And apparently there were a bunch of other llamas waiting, <laughs> waiting for them. Now back to the misfits. So they arrived you know, on the Apple journey across the United States, her and Henri Cartier-Bresson, another dyed in wool European. Um, and she took some photographs of Marilyn Monroe and um, when asked how the marriage between Marilyn and Arthur Miller was going, she said, ah, great, they seem like so happy. <laughs> so she wasn't really paying attention to what was going on. I guess she just didn't know. Um, the Misfits was, had a lot of troubles. They had to wait a long time. A lot of waiting happened for, um, for Marilyn to be able to get ready. Um, It was an extraordinary moment though, because there were so many photographers, great photographers on the set. Um, I don't think that's ever been done again, where you have so many really, really great photographers on a set. I, I don't know what their arrangement was, but it really is rare. Um, I believe this is at a rodeo. That's her, that's Inga. This is part of, part of the shooting of the Misfits. This is another movie um, with uh, um, Audrey Hepburn. I believe it's being directed by John Houston. She did quite a lot of 
film set work. Uh, she was also very close friends with uh, Yul Brynner. This is another movie with, obviously, Ingrid Bergman. Taras Bulba, this one was called. I love the color in this. this. It's a great photograph. Paris. It's on the set of Death of a Salesman, the movie that they made with Dustin Hoffman. Oh, that's uh, Volker Schlondorf from behind. I don't know who this is, but that's a fascinating situation. Um, Louise Bourgeois was a very close friend of my mother's and a great sculptor uh, and was an example of one of the many artists that my mother photographed over the years. She had a special way with artists and she made them feel at ease and that they, she was on, her, on their side. Um, she respected them and understood them. You can see, I don't know if you noticed the little, there's a little sculpture of a pair of legs sticking out of something. It's hard to tell, but it's funny, like with all those wrapped up pastries mixed up with it. <laughs> sort of funny little surreal. This is Giacometti. So this would have been, I guess, in the 1950s in Paris. Some of her studio work in general is really second to none, I think, amazing. Simone Signore. Yves Montand, right? Audrey Hepburn. This is John Houston at his home in Ireland. I think it was New Year's Eve. <laughs> Sorry. Stravinsky. in New York. This is me and my father um, in his uh, wood shop where he made a lot of furniture. And I was uh, shooting a documentary which I worked on for 20 years. And I mean, I didn't really work on it. I just took film for a long, long time. And this was one day of it. And that's, that's a portrait of me as a young woman. I love this portrait. This is Alexander Calder. He was, in a way, he was the first person to really, um, the art, an artist to populate this little corner of Connecticut where my father ended up going as well. And um, she took wonderful photographs of him. This is his studio. Um, and that's his home. That's Alexander, Sandy Calder's home where he lived um, in Connecticut. And that's Arthur on the left. Salman Rushdie. And this is Picasso who gave her a beautiful 
um, days and liked her very much. She, she took pictures also in his studio. Many artists that, you know, that she uh, photographed over the years. It really is extraordinary how this archive intersects with so many other people's work and so much of the life of the 20th century, really. There's a story that, you know, I think is particularly relevant for my mother um, of the when she, there was a bomb raid in Berlin when she was in Berlin and uh, she had just bought some violets from an old lady on the street and sort of unconsciously for some reason she held the violets over her head as she ran across around down the street as if they were going to protect her from the bombs that were falling and to me that is so classic of my mother because they were something that was beautiful and they might protect her and I do think that she thought of art as a kind of a protection um, from violence and ugliness. That's Ernst Haas and Henri Cartier-Bresson song. the right is Henri and Ernst was one of her dear, dear friends and Henri was a mentor and a very, very important part of her life. And they're both great photographers. Whoops. Neruda. Philip Roth, who's also a neighbor. Liechtenstein, I guess. I actually, <laughs> I'm assuming. <laughs> I love that photo. Uh, Alex Katz. Again, this is wonderful because there's something about this photo that really feels like a cat's painting somehow. And now my mother would one day, you know, she was very close with Saul Steinberg, who was the great, you know, cartoonist for the New Yorker. And one day she was supposed to take a picture of him in his studio. And he opened the door with a mask, with a mask made of paper uh, that had been cut out of a paper bag and like drawn on like this. <laughs> and, she, and then she ended up taking his picture in the mask. And that was the beginning of this mask series, which is one of the great series um, that she that that she really did, I think. Uh, and it was this wonderful collaboration between them. It really kind of lampoons 1950s or 60s society, or just society forever and always. And the masks we wear, but I love them. There she is. Yeah, she was an extraordinary person. I mean, really, you know, there's no, she was very, she was really unique. And even her accent was a kind of um, impossible to imitate because it was German intonation, French intonation, English intonation. It was very hard to kind of put your put a pin on. You couldn't, if anyone tried to talk like my mother, they never sounded quite right. You know, she was, uh, and she was a lot of contradictory things. Um, and she was managed to remain a mystery, uh, but, and yet be so open and friendly and loving. Um, she really was in the crosshairs of history and yet uh, came out triumphant having lived a beautiful life. And uh, 
with many, many sad things and many beautiful things. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, and she was a true artist, like down to her, down to her bone. <laughs>